Welcome to the Columbia Memorial Space Center Holiday Stemibration. I'm Ben, the president of the Columbia Memorial Space Center, and we want to welcome you to our virtual holiday holiday day. Um, today we're going to have uh, some fantastic STEM uh, activities for you. We're going to delve into some of the science behind the holidays at this time of year. Also, I want to say, I don't know if you know this, but back in 1968, the first human crew orbited the moon for the very first time on Christmas Eve. That was the crew of Apollo 8. And so here at the Columbia Memorial Space Center, as you know, we are on the grounds where all of those Apollo spaceships were designed and built. And because of that historic Apollo 8 mission, uh, we take the holidays very seriously because there's a real connection to our spacecraft and that holiday. I hope you have a wonderful time. You have a great host today. You have some great guests. Uh, do some of the hands-on activities and there's a big finale at the end. Take care, thank you, and welcome. Thank you, Ben, for that wonderful welcome. I'm Anitra, and I will be your host today. For those of you who don't know me, normally I am the archivist and curator here at the Columbia Memorial Space Center, but today I am your host, along with my best new friend, Bulby, and we're gonna have a wonderful holiday stemibration with all of you today. Now, remember, if you do any of the demos at home today that we're gonna show you, be sure to share your photos and tag us at Columbia Space. And if you like what you're seeing, don't forget to like and subscribe to our station. So first up on deck today, we have Giovanni Ortiz demonstrating how to keep those reindeer teeth clean and warm with some special reindeer toothpaste. You can do it too with just a few easy to find ingredients at home. Hi, my name is Giovanni Ortiz, and I volunteer here at the Memorial Space Center here in Downey. And today, I would like to present to you all on how to make the reindeer toothpaste. This is our cardboard box, which we will need to contain our experiment, since it's going to be extremely messy. This is the yeast, yeast mixture, which contains three tablespoons of water and a dry packet of yeast. And this is our food coloring, which can be any color you want, and it's optional, by the way. And this is for to contain our mixtures, which you could use a bottle, but I prefer to use this. And you could use a tablespoon of dish soap. And finally, use half a cup of hydrogen peroxide, which you could find by, in a hair salon. First, we're going to place our box, and then I'm going to place my flask. And then next, we're going to place one tablespoon of dish soap. And then we would add the food coloring, again, if you wish. Add a few drops. And then next, we add the hydrogen peroxide. This is where the fun part begins. We're gonna add our yeast water mixture in and now you see the reason why there's foam appearing is because the yeast and water mixture is decomposing the hydrogen peroxide. Now go ahead and touch it you'll see that it's pretty warm. The reason why it is, it's because it's exothermic reaction. Exothermic reaction means there's heat coming out of the substance. Thank you for joining me on this experiment. I hope everyone has a happy holiday and I wish everyone to stay safe out there. Well, that's one way to stay warm at the North Pole. Speaking of things to keep you warm, Claudia Daly from the City of Downey Library is here to read a story about a little mouse that makes something to keep her friend warm. Good day, this is Miss Claudia from the Downey City Library, and I am reading you a brand new 2020 book. You've probably never heard of it. That's what I'm hoping. It's called Mistletoe, A Christmas Story by Tad Hills. Mistletoe greets the chilly morning. Snow is falling. What a beautiful day. Finally, it feels like Christmas, she thinks, and she is so happy. 
By the time she gets to Norwell's house, the snow is almost to her knees. Nothing makes her happier. Norwell, Norwell, come out. Norwell, it's snowing. Mistletoe keeps calling. Norwell watches Mistletoe. It sure looks cold out there, Norwell says to himself. Too cold for an elephant. Do you see him there in the window? Mistletoe is cold out there. It's cold out there. Why don't you come in and sit by the fire and have some tea? Just a drop for me, said Mistletoe, and just a crumb of a cookie. Please, said Mistletoe. And after tea, can we go for a walk in the snow, said Mistletoe. Norwell and Mistletoe sit by the warm and toasty fire. Isn't this nice, Mistletoe, says Norwell. Oh, yes, indeed it is, Mistletoe agrees. But wouldn't it be nice if we took a walk in the snow? Later, Mistletoe helps Norwell decorate his tree. After we put the star on the top, I think it would be a good idea if we got out, went outside and stuck out our toe our tongues and let snow flakes uh, fall on our tongues. Mmm, I don't know, Norwell walks to the window. He watches the snow fall. Brr, he says. It looks even colder out there now, mistletoe. I think I'm going to stay in a nice cozy house. So mistletoe puts on, on her hat and her coat, and her scarf, and mittens, and sets out to walk home. She soon finds herself in a field of snow. As evening approaches, the world turns blue. She stops. She is quiet and still, as still as, she, as she's ever been in her entire life. Norwell it should be here with me to listen to the falling snow, she thinks. Suddenly, she has a great idea. Mistletoe cannot wait to get home. She cannot get home fast enough. And when she gets inside, she tosses off her uh, snow clothes and she runs up to the attic as fast as she can go. And she climbs into her attic and she finds just what she needs, boxes and boxes of yarn. She sits down on the couch and she starts knitting as fast as she can. She can never have enough yarn. Look at all the yarn around her. She has huge balls of yarn. Mistletoe knits whenever she can. She knits as the sun comes up. She knits as the sun goes down. She knits while she reads. She knits while she makes cookies for Santa. She even knits in the bathtub, which isn't easy to do. It isn't really easy at all to do. Days pass. Christmas nears. Mistletoe knits and knits using every bit of yarn that she can find around her house. Mistletoe realizes two things. One, sometimes you don't have enough yarn. And two, elephants are big. And um, so she stops by her favorite yarn shop and she gets some more and she has a big sled full of yarn. Lots of pretty colors too. Finally, <clears throat> on Christmas Eve, Mistletoe puts down her knitting needles. Her fingers are so tired. Her work is done. She watches the snow fall outside her windows and thinks of Norwell. Ah, Christmas, she smiles. Then Mistletoe nestles into her soft knitting and she falls deeply into sleep. The next morning, Mistletoe opens her eyes and she sees a living, her living room all decorated, and she goes, Christmas is here! And then lots of children do that on Christmas morning. The, the um, cookies are all gone, and there's beautiful wrapped presents for her. 
and she calls up the chimney. Thank you, Santa. Merry Christmas. Opening her presents will have to wait, though, because mistletoe has other plans. First, she has to put on her pretty Christmas dress. Then she carefully folds the gift she has made for Norwell and adds a ribbon, and she squeezes the gift through the front door. Oh, whoa, because a little mouse house, it's really hard to get it through. Merry Christmas, mistletoe, um, Norwell says. Come in, I have something special for you. Norwell hands mistletoe the most beautiful wrap package she has ever seen. Mistletoe carefully opens it and discovers a painting of her in the snow. And it's perfect, Norwell. You do love snow, mistletoe. Indeed I do. And look at her hold, hold, proudly holding up her picture of herself in the snow. When it's Norwell's turn to open his gift, Mistletoe asks, Do you know what it is, Norwell? I don't know what it is, but I love it. Oh, Mistletoe, it is so colorful. It is so soft. It will keep you toasty and warm, Mistletoe tells Norwell. Outside in the snow. I wonder what he's going to say this time. You know what he usually says about going outside. You do like to be toasty and warm, Norwell, said Mistletoe. Indeed I do. And he was. Look at what she made him. Whoa, isn't that beautiful? And he was going to be nice and warm. So I hope you like the book. Anyway, I want to tell you that there's lots of fun story times on the Downey City Library website, downeylibrary.org. And right now we have a message from Santa for you. And there's always something fun. We have crafts and we have cooking things. And so why don't you try us out? So anyway, it was so good to be with you this um, today. Uh, have a Merry Christmas. Goodbye. Thank you, Claudia, for that cozy story time. Homemade presents are always a nice, thoughtful gift. Now, did you know that you are doing physics every time you spin a dreidel? Soraya Kantar is here to show you how to make your own dreidel so you can see inertia and angular movement in action. Here is a fun and easy tutorial on creating your own dreidel for Hanukkah. You'll need cardboard, tape, scissors, sharpie, and a pencil. What I'm doing here is I'm sketching out a rectangle and I'm going to go ahead and draw four triangles right at the bottom. And this is going to be pretty much my dreidel base. After I'm done sketching, I'm just going to go ahead and cut everything out. Now what you want to do is you're going to go ahead and bend all the little creases so that you can go ahead and bend this a lot easier. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm just shaping up my dreidel. I'm going to go ahead and grab a pencil and I'm going to poke it right through. So once I poke the pencil through, I'm actually going to use this as my handle for my dreidel. Next, I'm going to go ahead and use tape. I went ahead and switched tapes and used duct tape instead because I think it's a little bit sturdier. And I just taped it all the way around and I made my dreidel brown. I'm going to go ahead and start adding the symbols because the symbols are the most important part of the dreidel. The symbols form an acronym for the Hebrew saying, a great miracle happened there. And you'll see Shin, Hey, Gimel, and Nun. Once you place all the symbols, go ahead and spin it and see how it works and have fun. Now you can gather around the family and play the dreidel game while you're at home this holiday season. Next up, we have a live interview with Carrie Dean. And there she is. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Mitra. Thanks for having me today. Of course. Thank you for being here. So first, this is, oh, nope, he's over here. This is Bulby. <laughs> I just want to Hi, introduce Bulby. you really quick. He's going to be with us while we talk today. And I think he's going to be really interested in what you have to say. Oh, great. I do love light bulbs. <laughs> Perfect. So, Carrie, can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what it is that you do career-wise? 
Great. So I am a historian. I like to consider myself a cultural historian, but I'm a holiday historian too. So a lot of my research actually revolves around uh, Christmas trees and Christmas lights. I look at the history, the cultural history and the environmental history of the Christmas tree. I look at where they intersect in different meanings. Uh, I've done that also with uh, the history of Christmas lights and how we have this phenomenon of decorating our houses in tree in lights um, during the holiday season. And that's my research. And then I work in a museum um, in Washington, D.C. for my career. So awesome. So a lot of people get Christmas trees this time of year, and there is a crazy debate over what is better, a real tree or a fake tree. Now, there's lots of personal opinions and cultural opinions, <laughs> but when it comes to the environment, what is the best choice? So they're both good choices. They just have their different benefits and their different consequences with having them. There's historically speaking, as a historian, what I look at is how have these pe how have people talked about these conversations throughout time? So once people started selling the Christmas tree, uh, it became it came to market um, in America and on the late 1880s. And by the 1900s, almost everyone had a, started to have Christmas trees in their house. Uh, during this time in the early 1900s, especially with Teddy Roosevelt as president, he was a big conservationist. So people started getting this myth that. Christmas trees weren't good for conservation and the environment. And people shouldn't have Christmas trees because they're cutting down trees. And why would we ever cut down a tree? And then people started selling him, like um, the person who started the Pinot uh, Giver, who started the, the Forest Service, he was explaining how that, no, this is actually not bad for the environment. We actually could use Christmas trees and cut them down as long as they're grown for that reason. Or if we go into a U.S. forest, which you can still do today, you get certain tagging, you can cut on the U.S. forest um, land, and you can get a Christmas tree from there. These trees are made specifically for this time. These trees, um, they grow, they take seven to eight, seven to eight years as an average, up to 10 years, up to 12 years. The higher the tree, the longer it takes. When you cut a tree, yes, you are cutting the tree, but those seven, eight years that it was in the environment, it, it produced so much CO2 into, the, into our air that we're getting those added benefits. And now once the artificial tree came out, once the plastic revolution happened and it became really famous, uh, really more popular around the 50s, we saw an increase in artificial trees um, and a decrease in real trees. However, now that we're starting to see the carbon footprint and really starting to understand where these plastic trees are made, especially currently when they're made overseas, they have to be transported overseas. They then have to go onto trucks. They have to go into stores. The carbon, carbon footprint of an artificial tree is very, very large. So unless you plan to have your artificial tree for over 10 years, your carbon footprint is actually larger with an artificial tree than it is for a real tree, even though you are cutting down a tree. So they both have their benefits. It just depends on how long you want it and which one, um, which one you think is better, you know, how you feel more comfortable in your house. If you just, if you want to have a tree for a long time, go for the artificial one. But if you want a new one every year, go for the real one. Carrie, what kind of tree do you have in your house? I have, I have an artificial tree. Um, I have my last artificial tree. It was passed down from my sister um, from her first apartment, then it came to my, my husband's first apartment, and we had it for about 15 years and just didn't quite make it after that. However, I never had an, a real tree because my sister was always allergic, so now that I have my own place, I plan to get uh, keep my artificial tree, too, since we just bought it a few years ago, keep it as long as I can, um, and I would like to get my own real tree eventually soon, too. So what happens when it comes time for us to be done with either our real tree or our fake tree? That's a great question because a lot of people think, oh, another bad thing about real trees is they just go in the trash. And that is true. A lot of times people don't know that there are recycling. And most cities have recycling options, um, especially in California. Um, Lake Elsinore, for instance, they started a program many years ago where they take in um, the trees and they collect them and they put them into reefs, into the lake. And these create new habitats and ecosystems for the fish and the other uh, animals in the, um, in, in the lakes. So this has been really a big popular strategy in the last 10 to 15 years of using that. People also use these real trees as mulch. Um, certain animals can use, eat them as well. So it just depends on what you do. I suggest if you do have a real tree to really look and research what your city has in place instead of just putting it on a curb because I'm sure it could be reused for something. I know that I live in the Redlands area. 
And our um, trash disposal company has already told us that the two weeks after Christmas, if we put our tree out to the curb, they will take them to recycle them and mix them with mulch and with the, um, the food waste scraps that they collect mm -hmm. as well to create the mulch. So I know that's what we're gonna do with our real tree because I love real trees and I get real trees every year. I love the smell. Okay. Um, Carrie, what do you think is one of the most interesting things about Christmas trees and the history of Christmas trees? Um, what I find the most interesting for my work is how long they've actually been a part of a tradition. They are, they're, they transcend just being a Christmas tra tra tradition. People have been bringing in evergreen um, greens from either a log or branches, um, boughs of different trees from the Roman times to pagans to really celebrate this midwinter celebration to really bring some greenery into the darkest time. Um, and same thing with lights. When we bring in lights into the house, it's the same thing. We want to really make sure people have been celebrating that for over a thousand years. It's not even related to Christmas. Is the fact that it's bringing in something, bringing in light, bringing in green, bringing in life, basically, in the middle of winter to um, to celebrate. Uh, so that's one of those interesting things I think is this really long lasting tradition. And as I celebrate it, as I research it in American history, I really find it so interesting how. Christmas trees have become an, um, a real identifier. People can relate to their trees. They use it to ex do self-expression. What you're interested in, your tree is going to look a lot different than my tree. What ornaments you put on. Um, the ornaments have a history, too, where you get them from, the story that they tell when you put it on. If you, you know, do you just buy them at a store, or did you handpick each one in every year and pick a new one? Um, were they passed down from a grandparent? Where were they made? Um, a lot of the glass ornaments originated in Germany and Italy. And so there's a lot of history there too of bringing a lot of these traditions um, from Europe to the US before um, really the 1850s. We didn't have these traditions here with the, tr the Christmas tree and the Christmas decorations. So I really find that deep history really the most fascinating part in the meaning of it. What is the most important Christmas ornament that you have for your tree? Um, that's a good question. I know I haven't thought about that. I think I, th I, I, every year, my, my mom had given me some glass ornaments throughout, um, when we were younger, cause her, she got a lot of ornaments from my dad's mom. And then she started tradition years ago. She would always paint our name on glass ornaments. Um, and although a lot of people have steered away from glass ornaments because of the hazards of breaking, and everything. Um, we still do that. And um, when we moved, when I moved out on my own, uh, maybe over a decade ago, I did the same thing for all those living in my household, my, my, um, my niece, my sisters, my, uh, my husband and I, all our names are on bulbs in glitter pen. And those I think are the most meaningful because they're 10 years old, the glitter's coming off, but they have some symbol to us for it. My most special Christmas ornament is a little angel uh, made out of like a piece of chandelier. My grandma and I made them probably about 15, 20 years ago and she's since passed. So every year I take out mm. this little handmade angel and it's not very big, but I always make sure it's the highest hung ornament on my tree. And like, there's no tradition about that. It's just, mm -hmm. I make sure to put it as high as it can go and put nothing else higher other than the star on my tree. That's a great tradition and that's a great meet and it shows how, how much an ornament can be meaningful to someone. I like hearing that. So ornaments aren't the only thing on our trees. Lights are too. And you know a thing or two about <laughs> Christmas lights. Can you tell us a little bit about how we started putting lights on our trees? Yes, yeah, so I think the lights are one of the most things that really have drawn me to this topic. Um, I, I will just say a little background. I started wondering, I was driving by house is wondering why do people decorate their house and then why do they decorate their trees like what what compels us as people to do this but yet they're so pretty we love it so much and same thing with lights and I think about how lights started on the tree um you know they you know people start first fire bringing trees they did put on candles that was the most popular thing it was a huge fire hazard going through you know old newspapers how many fire incidents happen and the other thing is you can only be lit up for one day um, usually they would only light it on Christmas Eve and it'd be a big revealing to the children. Like, oh, we just looked this up, come look. Um, and that would be it. Um, if, if it didn't, if it didn't risk of the fire. 
Um, but once um, in once the light bulb became an actual invention and once the electricity took off, uh, New York City happened to be the first uh, place in the U.S. that had electric grid. And the president of the Edison Company, um, vice president, the vice president of Edison Company, Johnson, he um, decided that he wanted to light his Christmas tree specially for his children in his New York City apartment. So this happened in 1883, where he did it just for his children because, and that's another big thing about Christmas, it's always about the children and making the children happy. And that's what he wanted. He wanted to make his children happy. And how can he do that without this fire risk of, of candles? So he did that first on his Christmas tree. And then throughout the 1880s, Edison's company, they would bring in other, uh, they bring in like parties to come look at lights in the Christmas tree and always have them be around Christmas. And ever since Johnson lit his tree, it tends to be the way to go. But the lights are really expensive. And like I said, New York City happened to have a power grid, but most of the U.S. didn't, let alone other places in the world. So Christmas lights, as we know, with electricity, really didn't take off until after the 1930s. They're very expensive until the 1920s. Um, but most people in the U.S., they didn't have electricity until after the 30s with the, electri um, with the campaign during the Great Depression to electrify the U.S. So before that actually happened, uh, most people didn't have it. And if you did have electric lights, it really was a symbol of wealth. And that's when um, the whole unveiling became another thing. People would have parties just to unveil their Christmas tree and show their lights and their, their grand tree. And this was showing you what, how much money you had and that this was an important thing to, to do in your, in your um, statue. So when a lot of people think of Christmas lights outside, a lot of times, one of the things that comes to mind is Clark Griswold covering his house in every single light. My dream, yes. <laughs> when did that sort of really gaudy covering the house in as many lights as possible sort of start? <laughs> so that is what my, I wrote my master thesis on, basically, is outdoor Christmas lights. Um, I love Clark's house. That is my dream if I could do it. I would not want to pay that bill. But I love that house. Um, and that that always sticks me. And his Christmas tree. I mean, there's so many great things about that movie and that scene, those scenes. But I actually really look at the situation in California, which is great because we have, you know, you guys are here in the city of Downey. And Southern California was really the hub of the outdoor Christmas celebration. And it really is the people, it's a really where the epicenter of this outdoor Christmas light phenomenon started. Um, we had a few trees here and there spring up. With lights, you had, you know, you had people, you had the, you had the White House tree, um, you had other ones. But in 1920, and 23 with the White House, in 1920, in Altadena, California, the first Christmas tree lane was um, was started, and it still lights up every year. The only time it went dark was during World War II, and it's still there. And ever since then is really when Southern California started getting into this craze of lights of outdoor lights. And since Southern California has such great weather it made it very easy to always put these lights on the house. It wasn't, um, there wasn't a lot of those restrictions. And then really in the 1920s, it really took off in, in, in Southern California. There was competitions. Um, so I really think it really started here in 1920s. Um, and we didn't really see it expand though outward. People would have it in the 30s and 40s. We have to remember the 30s was a hard time, but people still wanted Christmas. That was one thing they weren't willing to compromise. Uh, they needed to have that joy. But once we had the post-war um, suburban explosion is when we really start seeing that everyone wants to keep up and they all want to have that perfect light display. And we start seeing guidebooks on how to do a perfect light display outside. Uh, that is really when it expanded past Southern California into being this real big national, national thing on every house. Um, you slowly see it from the 20s through the 50s, but 1950s and up and then we now have shows like The Great Christmas Light Fight and people just completely, ex you know, we have Clark Griswold in the 80s, so. I love this idea that people weren't willing to give up Christmas because we're in the mm -hmm. midst of a pandemic and a lot of things are closed. I know my family would normally mm -hmm. go to Disneyland. I know your family would probably not mm -hmm. go to yes. Disneyland. <laughs> um, and we can't, but there are so many drive through light shows going on right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so interesting, the way that these Christmas lights have sort of come back in a way that they once existed 30 years ago. 
I think that's a really good observation because you're right. We, we are, there, there is a national suffering happening right now and we need to remember that, but there's still some magic in Christmas. Um, and as I even argue, it's, it's not, a, it's not a religion, religious experience. It's really about this feel of nostalgia and this feel of warmth and being with family, especially looking at lights. Um, and you can just drive through these lights and really get that feeling and you can socially distance. I did go to one of those light shows a few weeks ago, drive through, and it was great. I got to spend time with my family, didn't have to talk to other people, um, and got to be separated from them, but I still got to enjoy all the lights, and it was, it was fabulous, and it really was kind of bringing that back. Um, and I think, I don't really think, but I think really, I think it's really more, I think it's really important to people this year because it's something that's a constant, and it's very important. Absolutely. So we only have a couple minutes left. If you have, for those of you watching, if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat. I'm watching right now, and I'd be more than happy to ask Carrie any of your questions. And while we're waiting and giving people a chance to ask their questions, Carrie, you told us you went to a drive through already, but um, how do you plan on spending the rest of the holidays? Um, just at home with my family, and uh, you know, I hope to keep driving by through more Christmas lights displays. And see, I like to just drive around neighborhoods and just see what they have I, I like to find the houses that have the music and see how those are done um I think that, that's probably my most exciting thing I'll be doing do you celebrate and any other holidays or just Christmas I do my family well we are very multicultural we um I was raised to to celebrate all, to also um, understand and celebrate uh, Hanukkah and that's another festival of lights we have. And there's so many festival of lights, there's so many lighted uh, celebrations in the month of December that I like to, rem to remind everyone that yes, we have Christmas lights, but there's other things that have lights too. Uh, Hanukkah is, is considered the festival of lights. It's, it's all lights, it's all about um, lighting candles to remember um, you know, one, night of, one night of oil that lasted. And it's all about light. Uh, we have other celebrations like Hanukkah, you, I mean, sorry, like Kwanzaa, um, also uses light. We also see that the Yule Law goes back to even before Christmas and the celebration of bringing in the lights that way. So I really like uh, to kind of bring that, bring that all back to when I celebrate too, is to look at all the other cultures um, and how they celebrate. That's so nice. Okay, just a reminder, if anyone else has any other questions, I think we have like a one or two more minutes. Um, Bulby wants to know... <laughs> Oh, he's over here. I keep forgetting he's over here. He <laughs> wants to know what your favorite color Christmas lights are. I I like a white I like white Christmas lights on my tree, and I like cold, I like uh, colored the old school like '80s colored ones on my house. I like I like houses that have the colored lights, and I like white on a Christmas tree. It's kind of clashes, but I don't care. <laughs> what do you what's think your about favorite color, Bobby? <laughs> Well, Bulby, of course, is blue. He likes blue. Uh, actually, I love a really, really bright LED blue bulb. Um, so that's what my house has. Are the, the, specifically the bright LED <laughs> blue. Um, I totally lost my train of thought, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> so if there's no questions for Carrie, it looks like we're going to be wrapping up soon. Harry, obviously learning about lights, learning about trees, these are science subjects, these are environmental subjects. They, even though you're a historian, it's still kind of STEM oriented. I'm curious, yeah. do you think of yourself as a professional who works in the field of STEM? When I, 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 I haven't until more recently, when I really evaluate the, as environmental historian, it's an interesting hat versus other historical um, versions. And I really like that I get to learn more about, I look at how the environment is um, a key player in the story and not just the backdrop of history. Um, and then even, but I do think, especially STEM, I do think, especially when I look at the lights, I had to learn a lot about technology, um, how engineering works. I don't understand it usually, but I had to learn it and I still like it. And now I understand it better because I now know how single wireling versus parallel wireling for light matters and how when um, my light bulbs aren't working right now and I had to go in and fix them in my little gadget. So I do think I work with STEM every day when I'm either fixing my lights or, you know, trying to understand how, you know, certain, you know, forestry management books are telling me how to grow 
a Christmas tree and what seeds are needed and what the process is or how I need to learn some engineering to understand how these lights even work and why, yet let alone to why they're so important to Americans. So I definitely think so. Awesome. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for being here. I had a great time ta talking to you. I know that Boldy also had a great time talking mm -hmm. to you. Uh, have a wonderful, happy holidays. Thank you for being here for our stem abrasion. Take care. We'll see you next time, Bye, Carrie. Thank you. <laughs> I love seeing bright red poissinus this time of year. Laura Brim is here to tell us what's so special about those bright red leaves. Hello, my name is Laura Brim and I'm an activity specialist at the Columbia Memorial Space Center. We're going to explore the science behind this beautiful plant called the poinsettia. I'm also going to show you a simple chemistry activity you can do at home with poinsettia leaves. We're going to make a pH indicator which will tell us if a liquid is an acid or an alkali. Alkalis are also known as bases. All you're going to need is a poinsettia, a couple of bowls, scissors, and a fork, a strainer, coffee filters, and some boiling water. Ask your parents to help with that part. You're also going to need a few different kinds of liquids like juice, milk, vinegar, bleach, or anything else you want to test. I'm going to use some baking soda mixed in water and grapefruit juice because my mom has a tree so we have a lot right now. So let's get started. Cut some of the red poinsettia leaves into small pieces and put them in your bowl. Carefully pour enough of the water to cover the leaves. You're only going to need about a cup. Mash the leaves with your fork. We're going to let that soak for a while, so let's learn about the poinsettia while we wait. The poinsettia is native to the southern region of Mexico and parts of Central America. It's a popular decoration during the holiday season in many parts of the world. There's an old Mexican legend that's been around for hundreds of years that tells the story of how this plant came to be a symbol of Las Posadas and Christmas. It's about a little girl named Pepita who lived in a small Mexican village. On the final night of Las Posadas, Pepita was sad because she didn't have a gift to offer for the Christmas Eve service. But a wise person told her any gift would be fine as long as it came from the heart. So she picked some green weeds as she walked to church that night. But when she placed them on the nativity scene, the weeds magically burst into beautiful red flowers. They call them Flores de Noche Buena. Well, as magical as that story is, we know there is actually a scientific reason the poinsettias change color. It's called photoperiodism, and it's related to how the days get longer and shorter as the seasons change. Many flowering plants prefer the longer days of spring and summer, but some plants, like the poinsettia, prefer the shorter days of fall and winter. The long nights trigger the poinsettia to switch from its green vegetative growth to a reproductive growth that produces flowers. And just a side note about the flowers, these little yellow things in the middle, those are the actual flowers. The red parts are just bona fide leaves that help attract birds and bees to help with the pollinating. But how do those leaves become modified? Well, they have a chemical in them called anthocyanin, which gives it a deep red color. Anthocyanin is always there, but we don't see it until the long winter nights make the green chlorophyll color fade away. We also find anthocyanin in foods we eat. Speaking of anthocyanin, let's get back to our science activity. The red leaves have been soaking in the hot water for at least 15 minutes, allowing the chemical from the leaves to mix with the water. The cool thing about anthocyanin is that it's pH sensitive, which means it changes color when something is an acid or an alkali. We're going to use the coffee filters to help us test that. Drain the water through a strainer to get rid of the leaves. Then soak a couple of coffee filters in the liquid. You'll need to spread them out so that they can dry before you use them. I happen to have one right here that's already dry. So now we need to cut the filter into strips. Now comes the fun part. 
I have my baking soda water and grapefruit juice. One is acidic and one is alkaline. Can you guess which one is which? The colors we're going to see don't quite match up with a standard pH scale. For the poinsettia pH, the more pink it is, the more acidic it is. And the more green it is, the more alkaline it is. So let's start with the grapefruit juice. Dip the coffee filter strip in and let's see what it is. Pink. Did you guess acid? Now let's check the baking soda water. Give it a little swirl and dip in another coffee filter strip. It is a light green. That's the alkaline. It's hard to see on camera, especially when they're wet. But you can let these dry and then, I happen to have some right here, you'll definitely see a difference. What else can you investigate? Hmm, I wonder what the pH value of eggnog is. Maybe I'll test that out later. This magical time of year often uh, sparks a lot of questions. So Ben sat down with an engineer and physicist, Ricardo Padillo, to ask some seasonal scientific questions. Happy holidays, everyone. My name is Ben, and I am the president of the Columbia Memorial Space Center. And we are super excited to be celebrating the season with you today. Um, and in fact, right now, because we are the Space Center and sciences and engineering are important to us, we have a real live engineer physicist here to answer a couple of seasonal questions, seasonal science questions for you. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Ricardo Padilla. He's a mechanical engineer at, <clears throat> um, at Beckman Coulter and uh, a company that uh, designs medical devices. And he also awesomely was a former staff member here at the Columbia Memorial Space Center. So we know that he knows his stuff and he was the exact person that we wanted to call to answer, ask these questions to. So Ricardo, hi, how are you doing? Hi, hi Ben, uh, hi. thanks for uh, inviting me. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, you have any, any, anything you wanna say at the beginning before I launch right into the questions? Uh, well, hopefully everyone's staying safe out there right now and, uh, and when this is, uh, all over. Uh, hopefully, uh, everyone will get a chance to thank you for uh, for this great show you're putting up uh, by coming down to the space center in Downey and uh, and showing their appreciation there. That's right. Thanks. Thanks for saying that. Actually, um, yeah, we're really excited to welcome people back into the building. It's been too long since we've seen the public, um, but we are super happy to engage with you, the public, right now uh, online. And so, all right, there's, we have a couple of questions, like I said, some seasonal science questions. And, you know, for one thing, we, there are many different cultures that have traditions and celebrations around this time of year that mark winter. Either really, it's kind of like the beginning to middle of winter. And Ricardo, I want to ask you, why do we have winter in the first place? What does winter even mean? Sure. So, so, Really, it all goes down to, to two things. Uh, one is the position of the earth uh, relative to the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say uh, more importantly, uh, what causes our, our seasons is the actual tilt of the earth. Uh, mm -hmm. So as you know, um, the, the earth is not perfectly vertical or or. Right. On on a on a straight axis it's actually tilted right. by i think it's about 20 degrees from from its axis uh so because it's tilted uh different uh areas of the earth and by the way uh it doesn't stay in just one tilt it actually wobbles back and forth ah, uh, throughout the year uh and so because of because of this tilt and this wobble uh, what actually happens is uh, you'll have certain areas of the earth which will have more light than, mm -hmm. uh, than other areas. And uh, as a result, uh, because uh, you have more light, which is energy uh, mm -hmm. coming from the sun and hitting the earth, uh, this will cause different areas of the earth to either heat up if more light is hitting it or... Mm -hmm. Uh, or they'll cool down if not enough light is hitting it. Right. Yeah, and so um, a lot of people actually think that 
as we all know, uh, the Earth's orbit around the sun is, is not a circle, it's an ellipse. Right, and right. so there's, there's portions where the, where the Earth is closer to the sun uh, than, than other times of the year. Uh, and so some people usually think, well, during winter, the Earth must be further away from the sun because if it's right. further away, it gets less energy. Uh, but actually, uh, it, it might be surprising to, to a lot of people to know that actually right now, this time of year, uh, in the, the winter time for us here in the Northern Hemisphere, mm -hmm. the, the Earth is actually closer to the sun than, than we are during the summer. Holy cow. And, yeah, and so, uh, so if you were to actually go down uh, to the Southern Hemisphere right now, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see that they're actually in summer right now. Sure. Uh, and, and it's also one of the reasons why summer in the Southern Hemisphere is actually colder, or not colder, uh, is actually warmer than mm -hmm. like the Northern Hemisphere. And why temperatures such as in Australia get so high during, during this time of year. Interesting. So it's a combination, it's a little bit of a combination of the tilt of the earth and the distance we are at any time during the year from the sun. Uh, right. But not, but for winter, it's not, um, that sort of decrease in energy from the tilt of the earth is what really kind of drives the season. And just so that everybody knows, like, I have my hand like this. So if we are, let's say, you know, here we are in LA in the summer in let's say the sun is over here. Right. So, we're in LA and we're, we're a little farther away from the sun, but then as the earth kind of goes around the sun, you know, and the, it's like this, <laughs> it gets to the other side. Whoa. Um, then all of a sudden California is a little bit tilted closer to the sun in the summertime. And then we get, we get more energy, right? Did I have, do I have that right? That's exactly right. right. And <laughs> Yeah, and it's also the reason why why in some countries, uh, such as in Scandinavia, for example, there mm -hmm. will be times of the year where they'll have up to an entire 24 hours of sunlight, and they have essentially no nighttime because, wow. because of the tilt of the earth. And then there's other times of the year where it'll be complete darkness for several months, and it's the same reason why. Yeah, that's amazing. And yeah, it's amazing that that the just the, the sort of basic geometry of where the Earth is has such a profound effect. Um, yeah. But you know, you were mentioning something about light before, and and you know, light is a form of energy. This season also, um, you know, again, many different cultural traditions celebrate uh, you know different holidays around this time, and a lot of them have light involved. I can think of you know Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and things like that. Um, and even the Christmas. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's the, what's the science, what's the nature of light? Um, I know it's always kind of this sort of emotional, sort of ethereal thing, but what, what's light really? Uh, well, uh, for, so light, uh, light is very interesting. Hmm. So light is actually, um, when we're taught in in physics class and as far as everything that that science knows so far uh, light is actually can you can treat it as both a particle uh, meaning something that that you can feel or mm -hmm. that can be measured physically mm -hmm. uh, and it can also uh, be a a wave uh, so just pure energy, just like a, a radio mm. wave, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and so light has both of those properties, which, mm. which so far, uh, nothing else really, really has. Uh, it, things are usually, they're either a particle or a wave. They don't have both, both of these. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, I guess for the, the particle side of things, um, what it allows uh, us to do is uh, not only, uh, you know, create things such as a solar sail, which essentially mm. what it does is uh, if you have, it, it works just like a, a regular sailboat out on the ocean where uh, you have uh, a piece of cloth or some material 
uh, that you extend very light and uh, and then you have in our case on earth we have wind which is mm -hmm. particles of air which which hit the sail and allow things to allow it to move forward mm -hmm. um, but in space uh, because you don't have uh, as much gravity uh, affecting you uh, mm -hmm. far enough away from say a planet uh, you can create these solar sails and <laughs> because of uh, because of the particle nature of light which is emitted by the sun or any star Mm -hmm. um, can have all these particles of light which hit these solar sails, which again <laughs> are super light, and essentially you can treat it uh, just like uh, like you would wind down on Earth. Of course, oh, it's wow. not as as powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, light is is very very small in terms of its particle size, right. but uh, but it behaves the same way, and eventually. Uh, you know, there's been experiments done so far that, that show that it works. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know Bill Nye's group, the Planetary Society, just uh, launched, I think, one or two solar sail experiments, and they actually they actually worked. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and it's thought that in the future, uh, as we continue to, to head out further and further into space and visit other planets or even other stars, uh, solar sails will actually provide... Uh, a very good propulsion system for that because huh. because they don't require any energy input in order to to actually let you sail through the through space awesome so, very so yeah so light light can have sort of physical effects not just the sort of the you know the being able to see kind of effects and it's so it's a form of energy that can be treated both as a wave or a particle that makes, right. that makes a lot of sense um cool all right well Kind of moving right along then on this um, and speak. So I know that light, the speed of light is about 186,000 miles per second per second, something like that. Um, and it's kind of like the, the speed limit, at least in, in current physics, it's a little bit like the speed limit of the universe. Like most, I don't think anything can really go faster than light in a physical sense. Um, mm -hmm. At this time of year, there is one object that seems to get around pretty quickly, and that object is Santa Claus. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about Santa from a phys sure. physicist's perspective. Um, how the heck is he able to get around the world in one night visiting every single child or good adult on Earth? Um, what, what is the physics of that? How, how, is, how fast does he have to go? Things like that. That that is a very good question, uh, and uh, I wish I knew uh, <laughs> because uh, you know whoever would be able to steal Santa's secret would would become a very well off person here on Earth. So so uh, I've actually done this uh, the math behind this before. No way! All right, bring it. Uh, so so. Let's say, so the way that you uh, do this, and, and it's really interesting because, you know, when you're in school, people always say, well, what am I ever going to use math for? Well, <laughs> well, if you ever want to figure out how fast Santa needs to travel to, to go around everywhere on Earth, well, you need to use math to, to do that. That's awesome. So stay in school, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so the way that you can do this calculation is um, essentially uh, we're we're going to do it very roughly here. Mm -hmm. So so thinking very basically, um, of course, there's a lot of factors that that would go into how fast Santa would actually need to travel. So how, how fast he actually does travel? Yes. Yeah. Yes. How fast he does travel. Uh, and of course, that's all affected by things like population, where people are living, how closely mm -hmm. they're clustered together. Uh, but here we're going to say in this calculation that everyone is spread equally throughout the entire planet. Okay. Uh, and, and that way, it lets the math become a lot easier. Sure. So, so let's say in this case, we're going to take the the total surface area of Earth, which, uh, which is what Santa would need to travel, 
Hmm. Uh, and so um, here, uh, I looked it up a, a little earlier, and it turns out that the surface area of Earth is about, it's 1.969 times 10 to the eighth square miles, which is, which is uh, night, a little over 19 or 196 uh, million miles, nice. square, square miles. <laughs> Now, let's say that uh, that Santa's sleigh, since I don't have uh, the drawing of his sleigh or the spec sheets on it, let's say his sleigh is roughly, we'll say six feet long uh, to fit, you know, Santa and whoever's flying along with him if he brings a helper along. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and let's say the sleigh is, is 12 feet long because, you know, and it, it needs to be big enough to hold all the gifts for all, all the toys, the yeah. So that gives us a, a, a rough area of his sleigh of, of 72 square feet, roughly. Okay. So taking that into consideration, uh, you would, uh, that gives you a, a standard, basically how much area gets used up by Santa as he travels throughout the earth. Got it. And he has, he has 24 hours to complete this task in because obviously mm -hmm. as he travels throughout the planet he gets extra time because he can just stay in the dark areas right uh, right right and he doesn't need to be worried about uh people seeing him mm -hmm. so uh dividing the total surface area that he can cover by uh how fast uh or how long he has to complete his task which is the 24 mm -hmm. hours we get that he would need to travel at roughly 5.29 times 10 to the 10th miles per hour, which is, <laughs> which is roughly 500 or, yeah, 52,000 million miles per hour, <laughs> which which just to give you uh, a context of that, yeah. the, the speed of light is 67 million miles per hour, hmm. uh, which means that he would need to travel roughly, or he does travel roughly, at least 70 times the speed of light. Wow. So Santa is this ultimate physicist who has figured out how to sort of break the speed limit, basically. Yeah, you know, I think uh, for for those of us that uh, that watch Star Trek, uh, it it might make us uh, yeah. a little glad that uh, that it seems that that Santa might have a warp drive on his sleigh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's figured out a way to to go interdimensionally or something like that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, you know, and uh, it, it's also possible, uh, you know, not to dive into into uh, uh, into the particle physics too much, but it is possible he could shrink himself down to a small enough size and has some sort of system on his sleigh where uh, mm -hmm. where he's able to to teleport himself and be in two places at once, which is something that science uh, has in the past few years been able to prove is is actually possible for for particle physics. Oh wow. And it's possible that that's how he, he's able to take care of all everyone and get their gifts to them at the same time as well. That's amazing. That Yeah. They'll, maybe he spends his summers at CERN in, in Switzerland and, you know, kind of looks over people's shoulders to make sure his calcula calculations are right and then, you know, applies it in the wintertime. Yeah. Uh, oh, what? Oh, I was just going to say, uh, <laughs> yeah, the CERN in, in Switzerland definitely would be a, a nice vacation spot for him. Yeah, I would think it's, yeah, it's a little mountainy. It's not too hot for him. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Ricardo, thank you so much. That was, that's really illuminating. <laughs> um, that's a light joke. Um, <laughs> but really, really appreciate you coming back and, and continuing to be a great supporter of the Space Center um, after these years. And uh, yeah, you want to, you are a, a practicing engineers, physicist out there. Um, you might tell everybody like just, you know, 
what places like the Space Center or, or you know, other museums or anything like that may have meant to you on your journey to, to get to be a, a real physicist, real engineer? Yeah, uh, I mean, for me, it, it had a, a very important impact. Uh, you know, places like the Space Center allow you to, to do things and explore things that, that you can't just do at home. Uh, you know, just either, it, it, of course, it's always good to read books and, and uh, mm -hmm. or go on the internet and watch YouTube videos. But places like the Space Center actually let you get your hands on uh, and get uh, down and dirty uh, <laughs> and actually practicing uh, the concepts that you read about. Uh, mm -hmm. so I, I always think about, uh, you know, at the Space Center, you, uh, there's the, the paper airplane building uh, station yeah. where you have a launcher and you can test different designs and, you know, when when you're when you are interested in those things uh having that that outlet to be able to essentially be be a scientist mm -hmm. and start putting getting your hands wet with and your feet wet with uh with all those concepts uh it it really makes a deep impact in in mm -hmm. you wanting to pursue a career uh, that that will one day lead you to to work at you know NASA JPL or or anywhere uh, that that you might be interested in. Oh, that's cool. Well, thanks thanks for that. We're we're happy to to be there for you and for everybody else out in the public. Um, Ricardo, thanks a lot. I hope you have a wonderful happy holiday and. Um, and again, my name is Ben. I'm the president of the Space Center. Thank you so much for joining us today throughout all this. And we hope that you have a wonderful science-filled season this year. Take care. Thanks, Ricardo. Right. Thank you, Ben. Have a good one. You too. Wow. Santa definitely deserves that Swiss vacation after all that fast flying. I need to get one of those warp drives. One of our favorite year-round activities is making slime. Never gets old. Sal Castillo will show us how to make some fluffy, glittery slime for the holidays. Hey everyone, my name is Saul Castillo and I am a volunteer at the Columbia Memorial Space Center. So some of you may remember me from Halloween where I made spooky slime. So now I'm back as the slime master to make holiday slime. So some of the materials we'll be needing to make slime include warm water mixed with borax solution, until that there are no visible borax clumps, a bowl to stir everything in, something to stir with, or you can use your hands, whichever, glitter to make it more festive, some shaving cream, glue, which I've already pre-poured out, and baby oil. So first we'll start off by pouring our glue into the bowl. Then we'll add about half of that of shaving cream. About three squirts of baby oil. And as much glitter as we want. So before adding the borax solution, we have to make sure that we stir everything first. And then we start adding borax solution. We have to add the borax solution slowly because if we add too much, the slime will, uh, will become too hard. So a little bit about slime is that it's actually a non-Newtonium uh, liquid because it has some characteristics of a liquid, but also some characteristics of a solid, so it can't be distinguished as either or. That's why it can be sort of slimy and squishy, but at the same time, you're able to pick it up. So after kneading it with my hands for a little while, we have our final product, our festive slime. So as you may notice, this slime isn't as slimy as one would expect, 
but that's because I added a little extra borax so that it wouldn't be too messy when I was finished. So at home, you can add less borax if you want in order to get it to be a little more slimy if you want. And here you can see a little bit how slimy it is and you can also see the glitter reflecting in the light a little bit. Uh, you could also use food coloring if you want instead of glitter or both. And yeah, this is slime. Thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. I hope you all had fun learning how to make slime. And also I hope that everyone has a safe and healthy holiday season. Hey, Bulby, what did you think of the slime master himself? Saul Castillo looks so relaxing to play with, huh, bud? <sighs> Abraham Marino is going to show us what else we can do with borax. Hi, my name is Abraham, and I'm a volunteer at the Columbia Memorial Space Center. So for today, we have a borax crystallization activity. And so for this activity, we're going to need a cup, a measuring cup of hot water, borax, pipe cleaners, some string, and a couple of pencils. First step, we're gonna need the parents to grab the boiling hot cup of water and pour it into the cup, just like so. There you go. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna grab a tablespoon full of borax. I'm gonna place it into the cup. Like and we're gonna do that about three times. There you go. Okay, and we're gonna keep stirring until all the borax clumps are gone. And so they appear to be all gone. So now we're just gonna put this aside and we're gonna shift our focus onto the pipe cleaners. So with the pipe cleaners, what we're gonna do is we're gonna twist and shape them into the, a decorative design that you want. So for me, I'm gonna make a star. So I'm just gonna twist it and, and then. Okay, once you get your shape, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna grab a piece of string and we're gonna tie it onto the top of our design. So just like this. So now that we have that, we're gonna tie the other end onto one of our pencils, just the same way. All right, so now that we have both of these items tied up to one another, we're gonna grab our borax mixture and we're gonna carefully dip it into the borax mixture, just like this. All right. So we don't want it to touch the bottom or the wall. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna twist until it finally just hangs on just above the bottom and that the pencil can just lay there flat without having to move. Right, there you go. Yeah. All right, so here I have three designs. I made another star and a snowball. And you guys can just basically go crazy with any design you want. So what you're seeing here is a process of crystal forming, which is called crystallization. Crystals often form in nature when liquids cool and start to harden. Certain molecules in the liquid gather together as they attempt to become stable. They do this in a uniform way and repeat that forms the crystal. You want to leave the pipe cleaners in the borax mixture for a couple hours until you, until you start to see the crystals form. Or you can leave it overnight like I did and get even more crystals. All right, so thank you guys for joining us this evening, and I hope you have a happy and healthy holiday season. I'm back! <laughs> I hope you are inspired to make some of your own ornaments for your tree at home. If you do so, don't forget to post a picture and tag us at Columbia Space. Speaking of decorating trees, we asked the community to send in pictures of homemade ornaments to help us decorate our version of a Christmas tree, our beloved Apollo capsule. Let's see what you guys made for our capsule.
our capsule looks so much more festive now. All submissions were entered into a raffle and the winner is Doc Sheetha. Congratulations. We will be contacting you to let you know what your prize is. But in the meantime, we appreciate you taking the time to send these in. Our community is so important to us and our community re it represents uh, the first principle of Kwanzaa, Umoja, which means unity. Soraya is back again to show you how to make a Kinara for Kwanzaa. Here's a quick tutorial on how to create your own Kinara for Kwanzaa. You'll be using scissors, tissue paper, tape, and cardstock in green, red, and black. The colored paper should be cut in half, and what I'm doing is I'm using a perfume bottle to roll up my candle, in other words. And I'm going to go ahead and wrap it and then tape it down so that it's nice and secure. In total, you should have three green, three red, and one long black one. Here I'm just grabbing some tape and putting it under my candle so that I can secure it on the base. And I'm using a hard cardstock paper so the base can be a little bit more firm and I'm placing all my candles on there. And it looks great. Now I'm grabbing yellow and orange tissue paper and putting the orange in between the yellow and creating this flame effect. And I'm doing this to all the candles that are in front of me and you can go ahead and do the same. And you're all done. The seven principles of Kwanzaa are such powerful qualities that we can all embrace. Next up, we have my good friend, Jose Manuel from the company Merci Mercado. You may have remembered from Spooky Science, I chomped on some of their delicious grasshoppers. Well, we wanted to interview them today to learn a little bit more about edible grasshoppers. So let's go ahead and roll that interview. In the meantime, Mercy Mercado should be in the chat box to engage with you guys while this pre-recorded interview is going on. So send them your questions. Hi everyone, with me today, I have Juan Manuel from Mercy Mercado. Uh, Juan, can you please go ahead and introduce yourself and Mercy Mercado to us? Sure thing, uh, Anitra, thank you. Very nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Juan Manuel Gutierrez and I'm one of the co-founders on a very interesting company, Mercy Mercado. As far as we know, we were the, the very first company that legally imported edible insects in the United States. Uh, that was around 10 years ago. We are four co-founders, uh, three of us from Mexico and one of us from France. And we just love uh, world cultures. We love uh, really good food, having great meals with family and friends. And, and we decided to found uh, Mercy Mercado because it was a great way to, to bring great gourmet food products, interesting, exotic food product, products to, to everybody's table. So we actually featured your product in our last live show, Spooky Science, and we had a great response, which is why we have you on today. A lot of people may not realize that there is a bit of a science tie to eating insects, and that's actually a huge part of your company's mission. So can you tell us more about your company's mission in related to the science in eating bugs? Absolutely, sure. So there are four values. Uh, number one, the health proposition, uh, the food product that, that food that we bring to the market has to be very healthy. Uh, that's number one. Number two has to be uh, versatile. That means that you can use it by itself as a snack, or you can use it as an ingredient in a recipe however you like it. Uh, the third one, it has to be sustainable in the sense that uh, we, we think of sustainability in, in many, many dimensions, but mainly economic sustainability, social sustainability, and of course, environmental sustainability, which is the one we are most familiar with, right? And the fourth value, it has to have great flavor, deliciousness, right? Those are the four, the four, um, the four values on which the company has been built. Now, as to the science component, the four of us are really big nerds. We love science. We strongly believe that science and technology uh, and human creativity and human uh, passion and motivation is going to bring a lot of solutions to many of the problems that, we, that we're facing currently in the world. And, and as to our company, 
Well, the, the scientific component is very simple. Our, our, our food products are very sustainable. That means that in, in the environmental point of view, we use less resources such as land or water to bring the same quantity of feed for human consumption as other resources that you might have, like a livestock, steak, chicken, poultry, pork, et cetera, et cetera. Would you be able to give us an example of that? Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. So for every, for every 10 units of feed that you give a cow, you're gonna get just 10% of usable uh, protein for human consumption. But if you, give, if you give 10 units of feed to the grasshoppers, for instance, so you're gonna get six times, six, six, 60%, six units out of 10, so 60%. So that means six times higher than the protein or the usable feed for human consumption that you're gonna get out of a cow, right? So that's one example. And of course, it is less land, less uh, water usage. It is, it is about less greenhouse gas emissions, right? It is uh, just raising or capturing uh, grasshoppers from the wilderness. It's just, it has like a fraction of the greenhouse gas emissions that you will see from other uh, resources, especially, especially livestock. Now, today we have a holiday show and there is a very strong holiday connection to how Merci Mercado was started. Tell us the first time you ever ate a grasshopper. I was, uh, the very first time that I, that I ate a grasshopper, I was at a dinner party over Christmas, by the way. It was a Christmas party. Um, I grew up in a part of Mexico where we do not eat grasshoppers or edible insects for that matter. We don't have that in our diet, right? But as you imagine, just like the United States, Mexico is a really big country. It, it has so many regions, so many cultures. Uh, states, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many traditions within, within Mexico. And in one of those parts of Mexico, Southern Mexico, it is, it is a fundamental part of their society uh, to use edible insects, right? In their diets, that's, that's regular part. Just like uh, in the United States, we, we started loving tacos and making tacos with tortillas and the tortillas, and, and then you add some meat, chicken, or whatever, uh, in, in, in Southern Mexico, you use grasshoppers, you use edible insects, right? So I was at the dinner party and we were having this uh, buffet, a, lot, a big selection of food. And, and, and a friend of ours came over and say, okay, if you like this, if you like seafood, if you like shrimp, there's absolutely no reason not to try gra uh, grasshoppers. And at the beginning, I was kind of weirded out because it's like, it's a grasshopper. How, how am I going to use that? I mean, how can, am I, I going to eat a grasshopper? But it turns out when you think about it and you think about it from the scientific point of view, right? And then you start comparing the grasshoppers to shrimp, for instance, from very clean, healthy, from a very clean and healthy lifestyle in itself because it's in the wilderness, just drinking fresh water, eating, you know, grass. And that's why it's called grasshopper because it's out of grass and, and, and uh, it feeds off grass and, uh, and, and it's uh, out there in nature. So the diet is very, is very friendly. It's, it's very light and friendly compared to, I don't know, a, a shrimp, for instance, when you catch a shrimp from the bottom of the ocean, you, you have no idea what's going on there. How, many, how much stuff that it's very dirty and not very sustainable and not very healthy, that's the stuff that the shrimp is eating, right? And, and, and when, when you compare that against the, grass, the grasshopper, you realize, wow, okay, yeah, you're right. So the, the, the grasshopper diet is much cleaner, more, sus, more sustainable, and it could be healthier to my body, right? So that's one. But then, and, and then when you catch the shrimp, just to give you one example, and, and again, I, I love shrimp, by the way, but when you catch the shrimp, it just come from, from the bottom of the ocean, pretty much straight to your plate. I mean, you maybe you, may, you might boil it, you might fry it a little bit, but that's it. There are like a one or two steps between catching shrimp and, and, and hitting your plate. In the case of grasshoppers, it's an entire process. It's capturing the grasshopper, cleaning it. It is about dehydrating it, uh, pre-cooking it, 
roasting it. Uh, so there's like a there's like a five or seven uh, step process between catching the grasshopper and bringing it to your table. Can you tell us what the process is for collecting grasshoppers? Sure. So our grasshoppers are not farmed. Uh, uh, grasshoppers, they have a, a really w weird uh, life slash reproduction cycle that scientists are still trying to figure out in order to kind of to farm them. But for the time being, there's no uh, process for that. So we need to capture them, collect them in nature, right? So, so there are fields, specific fields that where they, they, they are used exclusively for grasshoppers. You don't have any other food product or is not, uh, is not used, for, uh, used for, for forestry or agriculture or for livestock. It's, it's just a field exclusively for grasshoppers, right? And the, and the funny thing is that we work with uh, families, people, communities that wake up very, very early in the morning, uh, like before, uh, 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 before sunrise, and they go to these fields with uh, huge nets, right? And they, and they are just walking through the bushes, the forest, and, and, and the field, and, and they are capturing the grasshoppers before they are fully awake, right? Uh, grasshoppers, they, they, they are cold-blooded in that sense. So they need the sun, in, the sunlight, in order to get very active, to warm, the, warm them up a little bit and, and get active and, 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 and start the day, as, as, as we to speak. So with these nets, they are just uh, kind of waking up. They, they are very lethargic, very, very like a slow pace. So they are very easy to capture, right? If people wake up very late and they go to the field, let's say like around 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. or close to, to, uh, to noon, the grasshoppers are just jumping all over the place. It's just impossible to capture them, right? So you need to capture them very, very early in the morning, right? And once you capture them, right, they, they, they go to these processing facilities uh, where we collect the grasshoppers, we select the best product, and then we start the cooking process. So, but that's, that's how we collect it in, in Oaxaca, in Southern Mexico. I understand that you prepared a special recipe for us for the holidays. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure thing. Well, it is, it is a recipe very easy to make, especially for kids. Kids are going to love it. Everybody loves pasta. Everybody loves uh, uh, bolognese sauce, right? And everybody likes uh, cheese, right? So the only difference that, that, that we are adding this time is, is the grasshoppers, right? So instead of other kind of protein, we're adding grasshoppers. And it's always a success because, because all of our friends, our, our, our family, when they come over and, they, and, they, and we say, we're gonna prepare pasta, everybody loves pasta. And then when they try this uh, sauce with uh, grasshoppers, it's just delicious, it just blows them away. A little hesitant to try a whole grasshopper. Is there a better way to maybe ease their transition into the world of bug eating? Sure, at the company, we have two specific products where you don't have the, the full grasshopper. And, 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 and let me tell you something a little bit about it. So in that dehydration and preparation, pre-cooking, pre-toasting of the grasshoppers, all the legs, all the antenna, all the, all the wings, they just fall off. So we collect those, we smash them, we pulverize them, and then prepare these ground grasshoppers. And that's an ingredient that you can add to every single recipe that you can think of. It could be hot cakes. It could be, it could be uh, for baking. It could be in your pasta, in, your, in any dish. Any dish that you're putting in the oven, you can sprinkle of this uh, ground grasshopper. And that way you will add in that, the very same protein that you have in the whole grasshopper. You are in the same protein to to that recipe, and then you are adding a new flavor, right? So that's really one, one, one really good example. The other one is we, uh, we bring to the market salts, 
uh, in, in salts. And just to give you uh, an idea that in Oaxaca, not only the grasshoppers is a very big component of their diet, but for instance, the salts, the salts, uh, which is called in Spanish, sal de gusano and sal de chapulín, grasshopper salt and, and worm salt. It's just a combination of sea salt with spices, chili peppers, and dehydrated worms or dehydrated grasshoppers, right? So you combine all those ingredients and then you have uh, this spice that you can add again to any other recipe, right? And in our case, sometimes when we're gonna be creative, you take one recipe and instead of using regular salt, table salt, you just replace it with worm salt or grasshopper salt. And the flavor is just amazing because it's, you are adding something different to a recipe that you already know, right? For our viewers who are interested in trying your product, where can they buy it? So you can go to our website. That's uh, www.mercymercado.com. So you will see our website. You will have a lot of information about uh, grasshoppers, the other products that we have, the history of our company, and of course, uh, the online store. And we have created this special code for the folks at the Columbia Memorial Space Center. And the code is uh, CMSC, again, CMSC. And that will give you a 15% discount on, on your purchase, right? And I'm pretty sure you're gonna use it because you're gonna love it. The, the products will be a great opportunity to bring something new to the table this Christmas. Thank you so much for that code, Juan Manuel. Um, I know I'm excited to use it. Uh, I'll definitely be using it. I know there's other great recipes on the website and there's an awesome grasshopper taco recipe that I'm probably mm -hmm. gonna incorporate into my holidays. So everyone make sure to go check out Mercy Mercado on social media. We have them tagged below, check out their website. Don't forget this very generous offer they have for all of our viewers, CMSC for an additional 15% off. And uh, thanks so much for being here with us, Juan Manuel. I love talking to you and we can't wait to talk to you again. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Juan Manuel. As a reminder, go check out mercymercado.com and use code CMSC for a special discount. Next up, it's almost time for a grand finale. But before we go, the amazing Kevin Tran has one more activity for you. He's going to show you how to light up your holiday cards by making a simple circuit. Sounds good, doesn't it, Bulby? <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Kevin. I'm an employee here at the Columbia Memorial Space Center. Today, I'm going to teach you how to make your own circuit LED card. All right, let's go over all of our materials. So our first material are going to be our LED. Now this is going to allow our cardstock to light itself up. Our second material is going to be our coin batteries. Now these batteries are the kind of batteries that you could find in a calculator or even a watch. Our third material is going to be our copper tape. Now our copper tape is going to allow all of the electricity flowing from our battery and power our LEDs. Lastly, our fourth and final material is going to be our cardstock. Now this cardstock is going to be our picture in which we are going to light up with our LEDs. All right, so let's look at our LED. Now our LED has two strands coming from it. One of them is longer than the other. Now, our longer side is going to be the positive side of our LED. Now, this is also called our anode. Now, the shorter side is for our negative side of our LED, and this is called our cathode. All right, so let's see if our battery can actually power our LED before we start doing anything else. Now, I'm going to grab a battery here, right? And my battery has both a positive and a negative side to it. Right, so I'm going to connect my positive side and it's going to be touching the longer side of my LED. And the shorter side should be touching the negative side of my LED. So once I connect these, we can actually see that my light bulb or my LED is actually being powered and it's turning on. We're gonna grab our LED and we're gonna poke a hole through our cardstock. All right, so this is going to be the center of where our light comes from on our small little picture. All right, so now that I have my LED punctured through my cardstock, we're gonna flip it over 
And if you notice at our LED, it's actually poking straight out. Now we don't want that, so we're going to actually split these apart, right? So we're gonna split apart our cathode and our anode to make sure that they don't touch. And now the next thing we need to do is to create our circuit. Now we're gonna grab some of our copper tape and we can start wherever. So I'm gonna start from the bottom. I'm gonna place my finger on my tape and I'm gonna pull back slowly. All right, so now that I have all my copper tape down, let's test it out. So let's grab our battery and place it onto our copper tape. Now something that you notice is that our battery isn't actually taped down so it can move left and right, up and down, or even it can fall to the ground. So I have some tape with me and I'm going to tape just one side of my battery. So this way we don't cover up the entire battery and our LED does not light up. So my tape is down and now let's see what happens once I fold my corner onto my battery. So when I flip over my Apollo capsule, right, you can see that it is actually lighting up. From using all four of our materials, we had our LEDs, our three volt batteries, our copper tape, and actually a picture to light up with us, right? You two can make this at home. Now from everyone here at the Columbia Memorial Space Center, happy holidays. You can order all of those inexpensive supplies online and find all kinds of fun things to do with them. So really quick, we're gonna throw it back to Ben Dicko, our museum director, one last time. All right, everyone, here it is, the finale, what we've been waiting for. You, as you know, the Columbia Memorial Space Center's holiday tradition is we light up our Apollo capsule. And I have to thank Charles Phoenix out there in the world because it was his idea many, many years ago and we've done it every year since. So are you ready? Here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Happy Holidays 2020, everyone. We hope you have a wonderful holiday season. We also want to show you here, we asked the community this season to send us holiday ornaments for uh, space themed and we were gonna put them up in the Space Center where we decided to put a couple up, up, a couple of them up on our, our version of a holiday tree, the Apollo capsule. So here's three entries. We're excited, they've been, all been entered into a raffle and we'll be, um, they'll be hearing from us soon. But I hope you enjoyed the day today. I hope that you had learned something and I really hope that you close out this very unique year of 2020 with a wonderful, happy holiday and Happy 2021, everyone. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, that's it, everyone. That's our show today. I want to thank our admin team, Ben and Sarah, our tech team, Diana, Soraya, Kevin, Monica, and Rick, our interviewees, Carrie Dean, Ricardo Padilla, and Juan Manuel, and our demo presenters, Giovanni, Claudia, Saul, and Abraham. That's it for me. I hope you guys have a wonderful holiday celebration. Now I'm going to go grab some hot cocoa with my best friend, Bulby. Bye, guys! <laughs>